Hello, everybody, and welcome to the virtual seminar series on Gaussian processes, spatiotemporal modeling, and decision-making systems. And um, I'm so excited to have everybody here. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is uh, Alex Trenin. I'm a postdoc at the University of Cambridge and one of the organizers. I'd like to thank my uh, fellow organizers, Jeff Pleiss, Lisa Simonova, and uh, Zia Wang for their work in helping to put the seminar series together. And uh, just a few announcements before we begin. So firstly, we've got some additional speakers in the next few weeks still. So you can find the upcoming schedule on our website, which is gp-seminar-series.github.io. So check that out. Uh, you can join seminars via Zoom, provided you uh, register and receive emails with the Zoom links, which can be done on the website. Or you can join via the uh, YouTube live stream, which doesn't require registration. Seminars always take place at 1600 UTC. And check your local time zone because that may have changed in some areas because of daylight savings. The way that we typically handle questions is uh, you can use Zoom's raise your hand option to ask questions, or you can type your questions in the chat and uh, either the speaker or somebody else can comment on this, uh, depending on sort of what the speaker's preferences are, whether they like to take questions during the talk or after the talk, it depends on uh, the situation. And with uh, all of this said, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Theo Galifaju, who is a PhD student at, uh, I'm not gonna attempt to pronounce uh, Tech, or maybe I am going to attempt to pronounce Technische Universität Berlin, uh, who will give uh, today's uh, seminar on augmented, automated augmented conjugate inference for Gaussian processes and a Julia perspective on Gaussian processes. Uh, Theo, take it away. The floor is yours. Hi. Thanks a lot, Alex, for the introduction. Um, you pronounced it almost right. Congratulations. Um, so yeah, it's my it's my great pleasure today to to talk about some work I've been doing in my PhD. So I'm already going to share my screen here. All right. Um, so today um, I'm going to talk about automated augmented conjugate inference for Gaussian processes, which is uh, a paper which we got out in ASTATS I think two years ago, um, but COVID time passed fast. And this is kind of the combination of some work we've been doing with uh, Florian Wenzel and Manfred Oper, who is my, my supervisor. So um, don't hesitate to ask any questions uh, during the talk, love to be interrupted. Um, and I'll give this talk about like this more sciencey thing, uh, take a break maybe to take more like uh, long questions and then move on to the Julia part to give you a small overview of like what we, we've been doing with uh, some other fellows in the, in the Julia community. So, okay, so I want to start with a strong motivation, which is a motivation for good representations. And I'm actually going to use um, another paper, uh, which is not from me, which is uh, Automatic Representation of Probabilistic Programs by Gorinova, Mora, and Hoffman, which makes the following um, thing, which um, makes the following claim. Like it's, representations in your um, probability graphical model is very important for inference. I mean, it's not new. And what they do in the paper is a bit more complex. They try to find the optimal parameterization, but they show that just by choosing a different parameterization, you can have a very strong um, influence on your inference. So for example, this is the centered and non-centered representation for a Gaussian regression model. Um, and this is actually also used a lot in the GP community because this corresponds to what we call the whitened and unwhitened uh, representation for, for the Gaussian process. So a very simple example of that is when you use a central representation, you get this Nils funnel, which is known as a nightmare of probabilistic inference because um, a lot of samplers or um, optimization methods just fail to, to converge for this thing. But if you actually use a non-centered representation, you get this nice, perfect isotropic Gaussian. But the two things are perfectly equivalent. We just reparameterized one by and given the other. 
So obviously it's much nicer to work with one on the right. I think you, I don't need to convince you for that, but the question is how to find them. So um, there's many way of, uh, there's many way you can find representation. It's a very general term. And um, here I'm just gonna look at Gaussian process and what we can do with them. So just quick intro for GPs. Uh, I think if you're in this seminar, you're already probably familiar with it. So a Gaussian process uh, for regression usually have some likelihood, uh, Gaussian likelihood, like the, that's the vanilla uh, flavor of GPs. And um, your Gaussian process prior is a Gaussian, the likelihood is Gaussian, everything is conjugate, and you can know the posterior analytically. So of course, I can skip some of the problems of this because we know there's a cubic complexity and uh, alternative methods are used to circumvent these problems. But generally, this works. Now the question is, how about other likelihoods? Well, I'm gonna call them non-conjugate likelihoods because Gaussian is the only one which is conjugate to the Gaussian process prior. And we have, for instance, uh, student T noise, Laplace noise. So we replace the likelihood noise by a different a non-Gaussian one. Uh, it could be classification with Bernoulli, or we have like anything which is a, which anything but a Gaussian is non-conjugate. And the problem with any of this likelihood is there is no analytical solution. Like there's no, uh, we cannot find, compute the posterior distribution in closed form. So for this, um, we have alternative uh, methods to, to, to solve this problem, which is, um, for example, sampling uh, approximate methods like um, inversion inference for, for the, stating the most famous one. But the problem is like most of these methods require gradients. For example, if you use Hamiltonian and Monte Carlo for sampling, uh, they can be unstable and you basically require a lot of machinery to, to make it work. So here's our plan. Let's try to find a uh, representation of this likelihood where we don't have any of these needs. So let's start with the beginning. We have a GP model, some input X, some output Y, and our GPF. Um, we want to construct what you call a conjugate augmentation, which means we add a new variable, omega, which is gonna make the conditional likelihood uh, conjugate with F. I'm gonna explain a bit more later. And why do we want to do this? This does not solve everything, um, but we get what called complete conditionals, which is the posterior of omega given the all, all the other variables and similarly for f. And from this, we can do very standard um, inference method like variational inference and Gibbs sampling. So this has been done already a few times um, and there are some very famous papers such by Paulson and Scott on um, polygamma latent variables for um, logistic regression. So for when you have a classification with logistic link, uh, you can augment this likelihood using polygonal variables. I'm gonna come back to this. And there are other things like the Bayesian SVM, and we extended it also to like multi-class uh, likelihoods. So there are a bunch of methods, and I'm just gonna explain you what they are. All of them are basically based on scale mixtures of Gaussians, uh, at least at the, at the basis. So what is a scale mixture of Gaussian? A scale mixture of Gaussian is a distribution which you can represent as an infinite sum, so an integral, where you vary the variance of the normal distribution. So we have a weight P of omega and we vary um, omega from zero to infinity. A canonical example of this is a student T distribution. The student T distribution is nothing but a scale mixture with an inverse gamma prior on omega. So P of omega is just inverse gamma with nu over two, nu over two. And here I just show a quick example. Uh, in blue, you have the true, um, in blue, you have the true distribution. And here I just sampled, I think, five omegas. I sum them up. So I basically sum functions. And I already get a very good estimate of the correct likelihood. Now, why do we want to do this? Um, the idea is that with this augmentation, um, with this scale mixture representation, we can add, like we have this, we have this normal distribution, which is so satisfying because we can use it directly in connection um, with our Gaussian prior, right? But it's still in an integral. So how do we get rid of the integral? 
Well, instead of marginalizing out, we marginalize in. So we add, we augment our model with a new omega. So now we have a new model, which I call the augmented model, which has a new likelihood, which depends on f and omega, and which is just a Gaussian, and a new prior on omega. And actually, the full conditionals are known in closed form. So we know exactly of p of f given y and omega, and we know exactly p of omega given y and f, which is some special thing. And again, I'm going to come back to this. Um, so what do we do with these full conditionals? Well, the first most obvious solution is Gibbs sampling. Um, Gibbs sampling has generally kind of bad fame. People don't like it so much. Um, and there are good reason for that is that if you, Gibbs sampling works, can work in two ways. Either, either you take one variable after another and it's very slow and it can be highly correlated and it will not work. Or you can try to take very big blocks of variable, which is called block Gibbs sampling. Um, and you just sample one block of variable after another. This can work really well, but it's really hard to find such distributions close to trying to find the posterior. But in our case, we know the full conditionals, the block full conditionals in closed form, so we don't have to make this effort. So that's the first uh, example on how it can be used. And another very simple example is a variational inference, and more particularly the um, KV updates that is described in um, the marginal inference paper from David Bly. So we know that the optimal um, variational parameters for Q of f and Q of omega are given by something expectation on the local uh, the full conditional. I mean, what I'm saying is that we can know Q of f and Q of omega, the optimal one, in uh, in closed form as well. So. There's also some more theoretical properties to this. This is basically equivalent to a natural gradient with step size one. And when you run it empirically, what you observe is a convergence rate of like exponential conversion. So the error goes as exponential of minus t, where t is the number of iterations. So that's all great, right? This So far, we have, we have um, a few papers which shows this is true and so shows that this worked really well. But one question remains, which is, how do you find the kernel mixtures? Uh, there are a few um, book cases, like the student T or the lab class, for example, but it's not obvious how we get the we get it from anything. And what this work is about is making one step in this direction. How can we find such a class of likelihoods which satisfy some properties and we can say this is a scale mixture? So one solution we found, uh, at least for a limited um, class of functions is a Schoenberg theorem. So it's a theorem from 1936 or something, which shows that if phi is a positive definite radial function, then it can be written as a scale mixture. So uh, here you have the exponential minus x squared, which is just our portion basically. And here we have our p of omega. And just to be to be precise, because uh, positive definite has many meanings in the world of mathematics, here we speak about the functional analysis type kind of positive definite, which means that um, the function has to be always positive, its derivative is always negative, the second derivative is always positive, etc. So it also means that we need functions that come from um, C infinity, so they are infinitely derivable, infinitely de differentiable, sorry. So how does this functions look like? Well, this basically corresponds to this um, super Gaussians, which are a bit more higher peaked in the center, but have heavier tails than the Gaussian. It makes sense, right? We are having a large um, collection of variants, which makes a heavier tail in total. So let's start from this. Let's assume now we found a phi, which is, um, which satisfy this Schoenberg theorem. Well, this integral is nothing else but a Laplace transform. So we can basically find this p of omega, which is still this unknown thing, by saying, uh, well, it's just the moment generating function of p of omega. And my phi is just the moment, moment generating function. So I just need to inverse Laplace transform and, of course, um, apply the right transformations. And I get this p of omega. So it's a really weird way of defining a distribution. But 
let's just take it as it is for now. And just to give you an idea how it looks like, um, a lot of those, not all, uh, come to, from this generalized inverse Gaussian distribution, which um, includes the inverse gamma as exponential, like many of the known um, distribution, which domain goes from zero to infinity. And just as a matter of expansion, I'm going to assume that I know this p of omega, and I'm just going to extend it as a, as a exponential family by just having this shift. So I call this this um, exponential shift. And this is going to help later for the full conditionals. OK, so let's go from the beginning. I have a likelihood. And this likelihood, I can write as some linear transformation, some, some linear transformation on f, and this phi, which is applied on a square function of something between y and f. So I'm trying to be as general as possible here. So I just have my h here is just basically a quadratic form on f. Um, just to give you a few examples, um, I talked about student t earlier. Here, my phi is just 1 plus uh, x over nu with this uh, power here. And this, this satisfies completely my uh, Schoenberg theorem. And my h squared thing is like this y squared minus 2yf plus f squared. And if I put this, if I uh, compute the inverse Laplace transform of this phi, I actually get the, exactly the inverse gamma distribution. And I can try again. I sample from my new, from my p of omega, and I get, again, something which matches my original likelihood. Um, so this is already a known case. Another known case is a logistic function, um, which we use a lot for classification. And we used to typically use this p of y equal 1, given f is sigma of f. Um, and we can just rewrite it as this 1 over 2 cos h with this exponential of y f on top. And again, if I use this, one of the cos h is basically just some kind of bell function. And um, then if I compute the inverse Laplace transform on this thing, I'm going to get absolutely nothing. Um, the polygamma, so it's a, we call it the polygamma distribution because it's been kind of specifically defined in an earlier paper, but it doesn't have any special meaning. And there's no closed form, uh, closed form formula for its um, density function. So still, I mean, I'm going to assume I can sample from it. And again, I can see that it matches pretty good the true likelihood here. Um, and you can get even more creative, because you could inv I invented, I mean, I don't know if it existed, but you can create a matter and free half likelihood, for instance. And when matter and free half is, again, a positive definite function, so I can show that this is correct. I actually get a closed form p of omega. I can sample from it, and this works pretty well. So yeah, and you can do this with matter on 5 half, 7 half, et cetera, et cetera, when you know the things in closed form. So um, let me go now to um, more of the concrete aspects of what's happening when, you, when you're doing version inference or, or Gibbs sampling. So version inference, um, to go very quickly, we have a certain distribution. Uh, so we, we, want to, we want to find the posterior distribution. Here, this would be this p of z given x. And instead of um, trying to directly get it, we, prov we provide a family of distribution, this q of z. And we try to optimize so a certain dissimilarity between the two, such that q of z is as close as possible as p of z given x. Uh, and there's infinitely many ways to do this. Um, and there's many assumptions you can do to make your life easier. So the first assumption we do is to say Q of F is uh, independent from, so F is independent from omega in my family of distributions. And each omega is independent from each other. But this actually comes from the model. We don't need an assumption for this. Um, so as I said, the optimal distributions are given by this uh, formulas, this exp exp uh, exponential of the expectation of the log of the full conditional. Um, and this is by basically minimizing the KL divergence between Q and P. So P being the, the posterior. Um, so let's just look at what happens. Um, we know that the uh, 
these things are just the likelihood times the prior. And we know that the expectation of the likelihood is going to be in closed form because it's just something quadratic. So in practice, all we have to do is compute the expectation of f, f squared, and the expectation of the omega i's. So expectation of f and f squared, this is very easy because q of f is Gaussian, and we know how to compute expectations. I mean, we know how to compute these moments uh, of Gaussians. Now the question is, how do we compute q of omega, uh, uh, expectation of omega given q of omega? Because omega, q of omega is, probably, is the same family of p of omega, and we, maybe it's really, really complicated to do anything with it. Well, it turns out it's actually very simple. Um, this is like a really cool connection with more like traditional statistical things. Um, the, you can compute moments by just like computing expectations, right? But there's another thing which is called the moment generating function, which you can use to compute moments as well. So for example, the first moment, which is this expectation of omega, is just the derivative of this moment generating function at equals zero. And the moment generating function, as I mentioned earlier, is just what we define. So it's just this um, Laplace transform on the distribution. So Laplace on Q of omega of minus t. And since Q of omega is just this inverse Laplace of something, we can actually just replace it by phi. And this gets us directly something very simple, which depends only in phi. So we basically skipped anything that is related to the density distribution, so to the density function, sorry. And we up directly get something which is easily computable by even using automatic differentiation. Mostly it's possible to get in closed form, but um, it's there. And we get something just as simple as this thing, where c squared is something which depends on other expectations. So. Um, what we end up with is a candidate ascent version inference scheme. So we basically update f, q of f, then we update, we update q of omega, q of f, q of omega, et cetera, et cetera. And this works very fast. So in one or two iterations, you're already very close to the optimum. Um, and this is shown here for like different likelihoods at the same time. And you see that you're really converging to in three steps. Um, now the question is like, okay, we, we made some approximations, right? Uh, what if we compare to another, um, what if we compare to something like uh, normal version inference? What's the difference? Well, the big difference is that Q of F times, when we applied the, when we applied the mean field uh, assumption between Q of F and Q of omega, we made a new assumption. So we cannot just say the same. And if we look at the elbow, um, the negative elbow in this case, we see that the R model is as a slightly higher negative, uh, lower elbow. So it's not as precise, but when you actually look at the uh, mean squared error, this is pretty much the same thing. So it doesn't really influence the result. And there's an another very interesting result, um, at least for the logistic case, which uh, was gotten by Jakola and Jordan, which basically says, if you take, um, if you take your version inference uh, bound, which is the elbow, and you try to make some kind of Taylor expansion around some new term. So you basically do some kind of convex optimization um, approach. You get the exact same um, model that we have. So interestingly, the two are very connected. And we show in one earlier paper that the two are like completely equivalent, except that Jakola and Jordan comes from a purely um, optimization, a pure optimization perspective, while we come from a probabilistic perspective. And of course, we can uh, take this to much larger models. So we can use sparse Gaussian processes. And uh, here we, we, have in, we are in blue and we compare to like very big data sets, SUSI has, for example, 10 million points, I think. Um, and we compare to both like uh, Adam and um, natural gradient. And the big difference with us and natural gradient is that in the natural, natural gradient case, you need to have, um, you need to choose the, st the step size very precisely so things don't go out of proportion. But in our case, since we already look for the optimal parameters, we don't need to do this. There's no convex things to solve or anything. And, it and then it ends up being much, much faster. But as you can see, um, the original uh, VI model can sometimes outperform in terms of accuracy. The, our model. 
Um, now to move to another another very clear example is Gibbs sampling. So the really cool thing about Gibbs sampling is, and something I did not maybe, maybe mention earlier, that our augmented model is still equivalent to the original model. What this means is that if we marginalize out omega from our model, we recover the original one. So you can really map your augmented model to the original model and back and forth as much as you want. And this mapping is broken when you use variational inference, but it's not if you use Gibbs sampling. So Gibbs sampling consists, as I said, in first sampling f and then sampling omegas. And it's quite expensive because it's n cubed per step, but um, it ended up being more efficient than other methods like HMC. A big problem is how do we sample from this weird distribution I talked about, this pi of phi is just like this inverse Laplace transform of a weird distribution. Well, one solution is Wolfram Alpha. You can hope that the inverse Laplace transform is indeed something in closed form. Um, but there are also solutions. For example, you can use the fact that the cumulative distribution function, so the CDF of omega, is given by this combination of Laplace transform and inverse Laplace transform. And when you do this, you can actually replace the Laplace transform by your phi, that's your um, positive definite function. And then you can use naive sampling. So you can basically sample from u between 0 and 1 and apply the inverse function f on u to obtain omega. And there's actually some um, smart approaches to do exactly this in, in paper by readout in 2009 um, that you can use, for example. But of course, you could try to set uh, your own specific sampler for your distribution, which is done, for example, for the polyagamas. So here I'm just showing um, the autocorrelation against the lag for different uh, sampling methods. Just as basic standard comparison, I put the Metropolis Hastings with random walk, so um, in, in orange. But the more interesting thing, and that people get very angry about sometimes when I show this, is this HMC. Um, so HMC here, I just looked for the optimal parameters via grid search, and then took them and showed what we got. For Gibbs, we don't have any parameters to tune or anything. This is automatic. And what you can see is that for most likelihood, at least on the first or second sample, you're already completely decorrelated from previous samples. So you basically get kind of almost a perfect sampler. Um, the reason for that is that we are basically sampling blocks, not variables. So we don't at all have this problem of, of correlation between variables. The f are correlated between each other, but we sample them at once, so there's no issue. And same thing for the omegas. Um, so just to summarize, the idea is to start with an initial likelihood. Um, then we augment it, and we get this like now uh, Gaussian, conditionally Gaussian likelihood, basically. And we can find the um, full conditional uh, given using, um, because this Gaussian one is going to be basically conjugate to everything. And then we can use your favorite scheme to, to find your an approximation to your posterior. Um, just to give you some more like perspective on what can be done by using more like hierarchical augmentations and things like this. Uh, here's a, another example of multi-class classification using a specific uh, link called logistics of max. Um, well, you have exactly the same thing. I'm going to show another example later. I have a work in progress to do heterostatic uh, regression for any kind of noise. And again, we at the end, we end up with like a fully um, conjugate, conditionally conjugate model. And of course, it just, there's other examples with a Poisson likelihood or with negative binomial, like a lot of things are, are possible, basically. Um, so yeah, this is just the end for, for this first part. So just to, to give you the take-home message, in this, we used um, auxiliary variable augmentation to get to a conjugate setting, which is then putting us back to all the methods which were used on like conjugate Gaussian processes can be used again. So anything like the, the TTS from 2009, which assumes that the um, likelihood is Gaussian, we can use it. Uh, the more recent power EP approach by Tongui is also usable because we just have a conjugate model. Um, I think I saw quickly the talk by Vincent Adam from, from last week. And this is also something which is applicable because it's just a matter of having an extra step, kind of like an expectation maximization, if you want. So we just make this inference 
easier and faster because we just work in the Gaussian setting, which is the one we love to work in and is not has not bad surprise. And as I said, it was, there's really this orthogonal approach. Like you can, we have an example where we made it work in the state space model. So it's like, a, you might know that GPs can be used in time series in linear time um, by using um, yeah filtering. And we can just use the same thing again. Like um, we have actually one example somewhere um, in a repo where we, we did this. Um, and one important point is that I focused a lot on Gaussian processes because this was like the start of, of this journey, but it's really working with anything as long as you have a Gaussian prior, or even if you don't have a Gaussian prior, you could augment also the prior and have some, what we call a Gaussian bridge between things. Um, the, the possibilities are infinite. <laughs> okay, um, I know this was a lot, sorry, I know it's a lot of math, but if you have questions, before I move on to talking more about uh, some some Julia stuff, maybe maybe now is a good time. So I have one question, but I do want to note to um, everybody else in the audience that uh, you can uh, uh, either type in the chat or use the Zoom raise your hand feature in order to ask the question. Um, but if nobody else has anything, then the question that I have is, um, in general, the uh, autocorrelation plots, we sort of, everybody likes to use them for diagnostics of like MCMC, uh, but it's not the case mathematically that that um, actually implies anything about the convergence of the chain. For instance, uh, you can have a chain with a very low autocorrelation because it gets stuck in one mode and never kind of moves out of there um for basically the entire iteration you run it for and you could cook up cook up, cook up examples mm -hmm. where that it sort of takes arbitrarily long for a chain to get unstuck um and so i'm just curious whether there's any kind of theory or results any kind of geometric ergodicity or things like this that's known about the class of mcmc algorithms that you propose that would uh, help rule out like such a possibility I mean, I think it's really gonna highly depend on your posterior in any case, right? Um, I think it's the same idea of, interestingly, that's like, again, another question of representation. If you have a bimodal, um, bimodal likelihood, you're gonna get this bimodal posterior and you might get stuck in one thing, but if you actually augment your model with, with a, an indicator variable, which says in which mode you are and actually use a mixture instead, uh, you might get other thing. So, yeah. So I use that as an example of how a chain yeah, yeah. might get stuck, but a chain need not get stuck in that particular way. So I'm just curious if uh, generally, any generally, we could use to rule out chains getting stuck in this scenario. I mean, I don't think it can really get stuck because generally, posterior. So, so the whole idea is that every time we're going to sample from F, um, we're going to sample from a Gaussian with just different variants. Um, and this actually allows to not get stuck because if you, um, typically the problem when you sample from um, student T distribution, student T likelihoods, even which HMC, is that uh, this is a posterior, the, the heavy tails of the likelihood tends to, it, it's there, so you should basically explore more of the tails. Um, but if you, uh, the problem with HMC is that it's not gonna, try to dare to go far enough generally to explore the whole tail. Whereas when you use this, basically you kind of change the variance all the time. So in one case, you're basically very picked around the mean, but the next time completely independently, it's gonna explore, it's gonna have like a massive variance and then explore the limits of it and come back. So you don't have any of this limit of getting stuck because you really move completely freely in the, in the parameter space. Um, at least that's a sample space. At least that's the way I understand it. But one thing we definitely want to explore is to have a direct estimation of what's the actual correlation between uh, F and Omega. And this should already give you, give a good indication of like how, if you sample two completely correlated thing, um, you might get better results generally, at least with a Gibbs sampler. And I don't think intuitively, I would say it would not get stuck, but yeah, I don't know any diagnosis that would actually tell you, tell you this. Um, okay, thank you so much.
Okay, well, um, don't hesitate to still write later or something. I can come back to it. But for now, um, I'm going to move to the second part, which is da, 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 I'm going to change computers. Here. Uh, just one second. Okay, I think it should work. And let me try to. So I try to take a very big font so um, everyone can, can read clearly. So for this uh, second part, I just want to talk about some work we've been doing um, and just to mention with the Julia in the Julia language. Um, so this includes people like uh, Will Tebert, which is in Cambridge, um, St. John in Alto, David Wittmann, the motion here in um, Uppsala, and Ross, who's also in Cambridge. And basically we had this idea of like, okay, um, there's many, um, many, it's so easy to basically to implement a Gaussian process in Julia. And we thought, let's try to, to write a really, really good library, uh, which everyone can use. And we had like this really big ambition of like, it should be both usable by someone who really wants to go down to the bone in terms of GP and play with the smallest blocks of existing to someone who just want to basically train a GP without wondering too much about it. Um, so if you're wondering for this presentation, I'm using something called Pluto, which is basically a reactive notebook, um, which also allows you to um, make presentations somehow. And the reactive notebook means that every cell is basically connected retro retroactively. So if you change something, um, everything is gonna change like as a cascade later. And it's pretty cool to make some kind of um, widgets and see how things are, are working. I really recommend just to have a try because it's generally a lot of fun. Uh, so I just wanted to make a small tour of this um, big framework we built and which is still very incomplete, but um, can do already a lot of things. And yeah, here I'm basically loading tons of packages. This is um, obscene how much there is, but uh, at the state right now. So let's go here. So the first thing we built is, of course, a kernel function. So we just want to have our kernels, right? And we wanted, so again, something which is really flexible and work both for beginners and for more expert people who wants to do something uh, a bit crazy. So for example, uh, here I'm just using the most simple case. I'm keeping the dimensions for later and I'm just creating a range of data between minus one and five, nothing fancy. Um, and here I just basically build my kernel and I can, uh, I can call, I can create my kernel matrix by just doing kernel matrix kernel X. So uh, Julia is basically a functional programming language. So you, I know in Python, you probably get something like kernel dot kernel matrix, but here we actually have an external function. Um, so just to show you what kind of things you can do. Um, so here's like the, the heat map of the, of the kernel matrix. And uh, of course I can use any kind of kernel I want. I can, um, an important thing we added is that you can have an input transformation before. So instead of having each kernel with its own length scale, we just basically, yeah, of course you scale the input and then you pass it to the kernel, which makes things much more general and much more flexible. So here, um, I need kernel here. So here I basically can change the, the, vari the length scale and do what I want. Um, I can also, uh, use a weak length scale because we know it's complicated to think about it. At least for me, it is. Um, you can combine kernels by, for example, adding them together or multiplying them together. Um, and you can even do, and that's, I think, one of the strengths of the, of the general, like a Julia programming language, you can mix with other things. So here's um, a neural network, which I took from, I mean, it's just a basic dense neural network using Flux, which is the main, um, one of the main uh, neural network library in Julia. Let me just use some, some real data. And here, basically, I can, uh, da -da -da. what did I do? Dance free. Of course, of course, when you use, do a live demo, things have to not work. Uh, 
Ah, yeah, sorry, it's because I should use this. Okay, name it. Okay, here. <laughs> um, so, for example, here I can use some kind of crazy thing um, and train my neural network, which is like this deep kernel learning, which comes here kind of for free by just passing this dense object. Um, yeah, and you can basically do any kind of thing. And we have like this additional things that you can use current current structures. You can use predictive definite matrix construction, multi output kernels are implemented as well. And uh, we're also working on trying to help the, the general APIs that you just want to vector or something. Um, and which means that if you work in non real domain, you can just pass a vector of whatever graph or something. And this is still follow still still going to follow the API without a problem. So that's the first building block, right? And from this building block, we can directly go to, to GPs. So um, we define a very general uh, abstract GP structure, which is really meant more as an API with just a very few concrete cases. So here I'm just getting uh, some data just to showcase a bit what's happening. Um, some sinus function with, uh, with some noise. And here's how things are built. And that's, I think, the, the most interesting part. Uh, let me use a normal kernel again. Like uh, this one uh, here. Okay, so um, basically, the first thing you build is a GP, and a GP is really in the sense of when you write in mathematics. In mathematics, um, when you write something like uh, Matcal GP. New zero uh, k, right? This is exactly what this is. So this is really a GP prior without any data associated to it. Um, now, how do we make it work with some actual data? We just apply it on uh, some data, obviously, and with some noise. And this is going to create a projection. So now this is really our prior, our uh, p of f, and this. From this, we can compute the mean, for example, we can compute the covariance and any statistics we want. And now the interesting thing is that this uh, f prior is an abstract MV normal. So this is another another package which is called distributions, with like PyMC or like this classical uh, distribution package you find anywhere. So anything that you can do with an abstract MV normal, you can do it with a GP, which makes a lot of sense, right? So from there, I can just build a posterior by giving a y. And um, what I get in return is actually another abstract GP. So another kind of this like abstract thing, except now it's basically conditioned on the fact that I have um, this posterior. And then I can just basically show um, uh, on some test data. So here, just go back on X. I can just show what the mean and variance is uh, on, on this example. And of course I can sample from it. I can do whatever I want. So yeah, that's very basic, nothing fancy here, but it at least provides some kind of um, some kind of API on like what, how things work and how can people build on it and make their own abstract GPs, their own final GPs. And we have like a large documentation which, which mentioned this. Um, the next thing we did was, okay, GPs are nice, but we know that they're very limited and a lot of people want to have sparse version of GPs and other fancy things. Um, so uh, the first thing we have is a VFE approximation from, from 2009. So here again, I'm building some more large data. Here we have like 1,000 points. Um, and it looks like this. I have this crazy, crazy function. And of course, we have also a package to find inducing points. Uh, here I can choose the k-means algorithm. And of course, it's randomized, so I might get different results every time. Here the data is a bit dense, so I think k-means has some trouble. Um, or you can use you can use a greedy algorithm, which was also presented by Titias and saying like what's the optimal position for each uh, each z, but it's a bit slower, of course, and not so good sometimes. I'm just gonna keep this k-means. Okay, I have my inducing points location, and now I can create my posterior by saying, hey, um, this time I'm actually using this VFE based on this inducing point. So a GP based on the inducing point with this noise. And then I have my um, data. So the, basically I'm playing with approximation, GPs, and just observations. And this is again a posterior. 
actually I've approximated posterior and I can show, I can use it in the exact same way as any other. So, so far, everything pretty simple and pretty straightforward. And we really try to insist on the one-to-one -one mapping between mass and, uh, and, um, and the code, which is pretty straightforward to do in Juliasm, especially since you can use any Unicode characters and things like this. Um, now, what about, I talked a lot about non-conjugate likelihoods. Um, what about them? So we have like additional approaches like um, the sparse version approximation module or the Laplace approximation. So obviously here we do the Laplace. Laplace. Here we just use any kind of um, sparse approximation without necessarily uh, Gaussian likelihood. So here, let me just get some data. Uh, I'm taking the banana, the very famous that banana data set. Um, so, and I'm already running some um, inducing points on it. Some, uh, I don't know where it is. Yeah, here, I'm doing it here, which is my own recipe for, for finding inducing points. And here I basically have my uh, representation. And here it gets a bit more technical because, and this is something we still working on because it looks very big and very ugly and it is. Um, but you can, um, you can basically build a sparse version of GP and that's the most important thing. So you basically get parameters. Here I have my mean and here I have my um, uh, covariance. So that's the version of parameters I want to pass. I could also pass some kernel parameters. I did not here for the sake of time. Uh, in, sp in space, and I basically build my latent GP, so um, with a likelihood. Here, the likelihood is Bernoulli, and um, I basically build my versional distribution. I build my G my GP, my, um, and then I can just create a versional approximation. Now, the interest is I can compute the elbow for this, and then I can pass it to any optimizer I want. And it's not basically we take um, solution from outside to do this and. It's just something to solve. It's just a function that returns a real, and then you can use whatever you want to solve it. Here we use this optim, which is for convex optimization. Um, and we run for like 20 iterations, and this is very slow and very annoying. And we are working on this as well. Um, but in the end, we can just build our sparse version of GP, and we can compute the posterior of it. And then we can look out at the predictions, and this looks pretty satisfying so far. So only with 20 iterations using uh, LBFGS, I think, yeah, this gives us the right results. Um, yeah. um, one thing I, I mentioned uh, earlier is the connection with uh, other privacy programming language, uh, such one very famous one is Turing, uh, used a lot in, uh, in the Julia community. So here I can just basically define a model. So here I have basically the, uh, it's called the, the variance of my kernel, I have the length scale of my kernel coming from this log normal distribution. So I'm guaranteed that they're positive. And I can just build my GP. And then I say Y just comes from this F uh, with some noise. And then I create my model by passing the same data I used earlier. And then I can just sample directly from, uh, from it. Um, and I'm using nuts, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, I can just use this sample to basically rebuild some, some examples or show for different hyperparameters, what do I get? So here I basically sample alpha and rho, and uh, yeah, you see it's changing over time. The results are a bit weird, but I did not debug it yet. <laughs> and finally, uh, I have my own package, which is doing these augmentations, and I want to show you quickly the, the multi-class example. Um, so I'm using the Palmer Penguins dataset because one should not use iris. And just to show you here, I'm just creating a data frame by loading the data. Um, I'm skipping out all the missing cases. I'm shuffling my data so it's more interesting. And I'm just, uh, in the end, picking two dimensions so we can see something because it's four dimensional, I think. Um, and again, it's lengthy and horrible. I'm very sorry. Uh, but the, the whole idea is that we want to create posterior distribution. And here we have this centered because we want it around zero. If I apply non-centered, this would be using the whitened uh, version basically. And then I have my cavity. So basically I have some, uh, I'm looking at the posterior for Q of omega, and then I just update my S and my M. 
and I do this for like 10 iterations. Um, and this is what I get. So I can, here I'm basically mapping the prediction to the RGB values so you can see something and you get something which kind of matches the data pretty well. And I could uh, think, yeah, I could play around with the scale. And since it's just like half a second, I can see like the live results pretty fast. Here it doesn't change much, but um, yeah, it's funny. It's a cool widget to play with. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's it. Um, yeah, if you have any questions regarding anything. Uh, and I will, of course, provide all this uh, somewhere to, if you want to play with it or something. Thanks, Theo. Um, if anybody has any questions, then uh, feel free to uh, ask in the chat or uh, <laughs> uh, use the raise your hand feature. I see there's one question, so I'm going to unmute uh, the. I mean, uh, yeah. I can also, as you, as you want. Hi, uh, thank you for so much for the talk. Yeah, my question is very um, simple. Could you tell us a bit more about your own recipe for inducing points? Sure. I, um, I mean, that's a kind of defeated project that Alex also knows pretty well. Um, I was working on trying to find automatic an automatic way to find inducing points and also to find the number of inducing points, depending on your accuracy. And it's based on an online streaming process um, actually, I think I have an example. Let me... So here, so that's another package I made, which is now a bit outdated. So if you want to work in an online setting, um, so you have like, again, I really love sinus, for example. Uh, you can basically create a kernel. This is this OIPS for online inducing point selection. And what happens is that every time you get a batch, you're going to look at the points and you're going to decide if it's close enough for one or the inducing points or not. If it's close, um, you reject it. And if it's far enough, you accept it. And then you basically build on a selection of inducing points like this. And you can fit here as a time series, but if you work in any dimension, uh, you could fit anything like this. Um, the reason it was a bit abundant was there's a lot of issues with it because the selection process depends on the kernels and the kernels depend on the inducing points and the inducing points depend on the selection process. So you basically get sometimes some bad, um, how do you say? Yeah, like a bad circle, vicious circle where you get into either too many inducing points or not enough. But um, yeah, I, I have this workshop paper somewhere which explained this um, and that's it. <laughs> Um, there's a question from Bobby again. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Just wondering if, um, thanks, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you've had any success or attempts to uh, extend this kind of non-conjugate inference to, to even sort of broader classes of likelihoods or? So, yeah, I mean, the, the theory I've showed is for a very specific, specific class, right? Uh, Human generating function. Um, and I'm writing, writing my thesis right now and putting all this in. So it's going to come soon, hopefully. Um, but the idea is that if you, the, the, if you can find a function which is basically the moment generating function of a, not, of a distribution, then you can automatically write it as a mixture. And it can be not only a scale mixture, but it can be any kind of like, um, like discrete mixture or a continuous mixture of any, any kind. And basically, we can stack mixtures together. Um, maybe I can I can show you quickly, like the, the, the case of the um, the case of the multi-class, for example, is actually a highly non-standard ones. 
Um, so yeah, just here I can show off a, a cool GIF where you can see what happens. Um, basically, you start with this, right? And you use other kind of augmentations. Basically, this kind of this property of like one over x is just the exponential of the integral of the exponential of minus lambda x d lambda. So you can use this kind of, of things to build on and add more and more variables. So that's one example. Um, then you have this, right? And you can use a property that sigma is, is symmetric around zero. And now you, under the um, wise i, you can recognize that this is a moment generating function of a Poisson distribution. So we can again augment it and use this like uh, sigma to the power of n. Uh, and now we can again continue. We add more more variables. And since we just have sigmas now, we can just use the polygamma and we basically get something which is fully conjugate. So the problem with this kind of approach, and that's something I'm also trying to solve a bit more, is that there's no formula for it. Like it'd be very satisfying that you give me a function and I tell you you do this, this, and this, and you get something out. Um, but yeah, this this kind of approach is which I think so far as I and maybe one of the people who can do or know or expert on, but there's no specific way to do it. And yeah. But yeah, anything which is a moment generating function can be transformed into a mixture, which can then be used as an augmentation. That's the general uh, approach. Okay, if you have time to questions, I'm just gonna read them about these PGP packages in Julia. Uh, have you looked into implementing the mini batch stochastic variational GPs of Hansman? So um, this would be just straightforward because uh, let me go here, present, tuck, tuck, tuck. Um, so here um, you could okay, yes, that's this would be the sparse version of approximation. Here to just yeah, sorry. Here, um, here in this big mess, right? Um, right now we're passing the whole data. Uh, actually, this would already work directly, I think. But here we're passing the whole data. Uh, where? Sorry. Yeah, here we're passing the whole data. We're passing this whole dot fx. We're passing the whole row of x, and you could just turn it into a stochastic thing by sending batches of data by using some data loader or something like this. You want? So it's. And yeah, what, what we really need to um, work on right now is making this like nice API where you just pass some data and you say, I want to use Hensman 2013 or 2015 or anything like this. Um, the second question is, has there, has there been any effort to use derivative kernels, conditioning the GPs on arbitrary kernels? Um, we did not work so much on it. I know there's some interest for sure. Um, but we did not take this approach. What we try to make sure so far is that most of the kernels are differentiable, and this is already unfortunately hard enough. <laughs> um, and we check that it works. So we have like a suite of tests for this. Um, but yeah, it would be really cool to have this um, kind of conditioning. I mean, it, one could just, we actually considered creating some kind of like wrapper around the kernel, which takes the derivative. And then you could just use the multi outputs kind of kernels where you could both condition on the kernel on the GP and on the derivative of the GP at the same time. Uh, I think it would be quite straightforward, but I think no one got the time or the will to do it. Um, yeah. So um, I just want to. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> okay, my audio is actually working. Um, so uh, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Theo, for the wonderful talk. Um, and uh, as we move to the question and answer and discussion period, which has uh, started, um, uh, I will, we, we will now move to the uh, final part, which is uh, no longer live streamed. So people can ask the more I don't know, controversial.
actual questions that they may have about the work. And so before doing that, I just want to thank all of the uh, listeners that we have on YouTube um, and remind that there is uh, another seminar that's uh, coming up uh, next week. And so you can just check that out on our website. And uh, yeah, with that said, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks a lot, everyone.